Quick editor's note, this week was supposed to be episode one of the Down Round Jamboree featuring a lot of different guests, but unfortunately, as you might be able to tell from my voice, I have COVID. Fortunately, we had this one in the archives that we alluded to earlier. It was supposed to go out during uh, James's honeymoon, and hopefully my um, coronavirus will have subsided by the end of the week and we can do our Down Round Jamboree. Happy holidays to all who celebrate. James? Raf, well, well, well. So it's come to this. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking the other day. Yep. Just came to me. There are some big companies in the world. Huge. Ten of them in particular are huge, are massive. Yep. What are the ten? That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> that thought just came to you yeah. independently. Yeah. And I was like, why doesn't someone do a podcast about it? Naming and shaming. Mm. These companies were getting too big. Too big for their britches. Well, I thought you were going to say naming and shaming all the podcasts who haven't done one. Oh, yeah, cool. Odd Lots haven't done it. All Lots haven't done one. All In Podcast has no, never done it. They have never done just like the They've top They've probably 10. done like their top 10 war crimes or something. <laughs> it's true. Serial. Yeah, Serial. Well, I know, you know, I know that's not really their- The bit. Daily. Has The Daily done it? The Daily's never done it. No. FT. Have they ever have have the, a podcast on it? No, you see, when it gets down to The Economist, they're all alighting with these kind of- Stories that they allege are very important about the global mm. economy, but they're never going to give you the st- straight down the line. Call me daddy. Call me. Call me daddy. Have never covered the top ten biggest. Joe Rogan. I reckon Joe Rogan maybe he might have. He might. He, have. Might, he might have done it. And he would. <laughs> <laughs> he would. His guests would have done it, and he would have been like, "That's crazy. That's cr- how many billion? Oh, holy fuck. That's crazy. Wait, is Spotify in there?" <laughs> He was like, okay, okay. But they paid me $250 million. So, and you're telling me that there are 10 bigger? I heard the Rothschilds were worth $1 trillion. Is that true? Uh, Joey, can you look that up? Ladies and gentlemen, the silly season has arrived. Has officially started. Normally it starts the beginning of December or maybe midway through December. But I'm as you listen to this, I'm currently sunning myself on a beach in Mexico. Mm. Or potentially in Mexico City. Okay. I'm geographically located in the Republic of Mexico. Some kind of metropolis. I'm not in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm not near a microphone. We record this ahead of time. So as a result, the silly season, the down round silly season where we get a bit nutty with it, Mm. begins now. I said on the Meeting Tree podcast, I'm on record as saying the silly season begins around October 28. But for me, I wind wind up from October. My birthday's in mid-October. Okay. Uh, Fuck, I doxed myself again. (laughs) So your birthday's in (laughs) mid-October. What Um, was your address again? (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, maybe text your boss, text your colleagues, happy silly season. Happy silly season. And then tell them, also, have you? did you know what the top 10 largest companies by market cap are? <laughs> How about by revenue? Well, here you go. Should we, we should start at 10 and go up or should we start at one and go down? That's a good question, actually. Because it's not like it's going to be a massive surprise when we get to the end. <laughs> that's true. But I still think it's worth doing 10 up, which is that's okay, tra- the, traditionally the, the that's count, the way the, count, the countdown format. Yeah, exactly. Let's do it. That's because there might be a couple of surprises in here for you. Yeah, and totally. Gonna, and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what this company does, we and what, chat. we don't know what we're going to say. We're going to chit chat, and we're going to we're going to go through and like what 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 it looks like the future is going to be. And the reason why this is down around adjacent is that almost all of them are tech companies. Mm. All almost all of them are tech companies, but not all of them. And there are some surprise. In fact, ten is good because we're going to start with a surprise right out of the gate. Mm. The number ten, the largest companies on earth by market cap, is Eli Lilly. Mm. Big Pharma. A big American big pharma conglomerate. Big Pharma wants a wife. Big Pharma wants a, wants a, wants a wife. That's, it's, which is currently worth $567.4 billion. So they do Prozac, they do a bunch of crap. But the reason that they're in the top 10 is the Azempic effect. It's the Azempic effect, yeah. Which uh, They don't do Azempic. They don't the make Azempic. They're not Nova Nordis. No, which is, as you would have heard on our Q&A episode last week, depending on the day, the most valuable company in Europe. Mm. Not today. 
Not not today, no. But it, it's making a competitor. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's had general great returns. It's a it, huge company. It's a huge company. It had a surge in its uh, stock price yeah. as a result of the fact that they are developing a Ozempic competitor. Yeah, Monjaro. Monjaro. Mon, Monjuro. Monjaro, which apparently is better. Uh, you know, it's it's marginally better than, than Ozempic. It's a semaglutide. It targets two receptors other than, like, one. But anyway, we've got an Ozempic episode coming soon in a, in a few weeks. Um, stick around for that where we go into that deep. But that is why they are number 10. Yeah, I mean, there needs there should be a big farmer in the top 10. You've got to have a big farmer up there. Right. I like, think for, for like, the, re- the reputation for, like, dominating evil yeah. that they have, it would be, it'd be an L to not have yeah. a rep. Yeah, yeah, they've got to have something in the top 10. So good on you, Eli Lilly. Well done. <laughs> Number 10 in the world by market cap. Great, great effort. Number nine is Tesla. Still amazing that a car company can be the ninth most valuable I mean, so obviously the reason Tesla is in there is insanely forward looking. If you're not across it, we had kind of went through this period of like where growth stocks, i.e. projecting a stock into the future and what they might be worth, they're the stocks you need to be investing in. That was a zero interest rate phenomenon. I mean, there's still growth stocks still exist as a concept, but Tesla was like the epitome of that because the investors, including the big institutional ones like ARK Invest, were projecting like this is going to be a $20 trillion company because- Every house will have a Tesla battery and be powered by Tesla solar, and therefore it's worth getting the Tesla car because of the ecosystem. And then you have a Tesla AI that's like running your house and like a blah, 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 blah. That was like the insane bull case for Tesla. Don't get me wrong. They seem to be doing pretty well, yep. s- selling quite a few cars. But at the end of the day, like I'd go Eli Lilly. Are you, you're in a, you're in a, you're, you're long Eli Lilly versus. Um, Versus Tesla? Over Tesla. I mean, it's still overpriced and overhyped, in my opinion, Tesla. Because from my perspective, like, they're already reducing prices. Cars are a commodified good. EVs certainly weren't Mm -hmm. and still aren't as commodified, but they're very, very quickly getting there, especially with the Chinese entrance. Blah, 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 blah. Tesla have a massive advantage, don't get me wrong. The fact that they've got the charging network out there is like a massive competitive advantage, but are they the ninth biggest company in the world? That's my opinion. What about you, James? No, I'm, I'm basically the same. As you know, Tesla was, it's probably the most prominent meme stock. Mm. It's not quite on the level of a GameStop in the sense that Tesla is actually creating value. But it has like a cultish fan base of people who not just buy the stock, but like evangelize it to an absurd degree. Mm. You know, it's the classic line, which we've repeated before, which is the idea that the stock is actually Tesla's core product. Yeah, It's not the cars. It's not anything else. So they've done well. And obviously, Elon's very good at keeping that hype train rolling. And that's mm. one of his core skill sets and making that happen. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens when like the, the Cybertruck comes out. Evidence seems to suggest that it certainly won't be as cheap as they thought it was going to be. Mm. Um, the long-term goal of Tesla is to get the prices of their vehicles down so that they're in the position where all of a sudden everyone has one. Yeah, and, and if, subscription revenue and blah, blah, blah. Subscription blah, blah. revenue. If they, perfect world that would keep Tesla up, up at that level is they can do that. They can bring prices down and then everyone's driving a Tesla and it's like the front tip of the spear of the EV revolution. Plus the fact if they have self-driving going and they, they've actually made that work. And there are other stuff, like if they can have everyone with like a power wall or, or the Tesla wall in their houses, great. But it's a pretty it's a pretty tall order to get all that stuff in a line, especially as Toyota, GM, all the other car companies are trying to make it happen too. So we'll see. We'll see. Hmm. The next one, Mr. Warren Buffett. Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire. Berkshire Hathaway's number one holding, I won't spoil it, but it's another company on the list. I mean, interesting company in that, well, they traded a premium. Berkshire Hathaway, if people don't know, they're a conglomerate that owns a bunch of other businesses. And the reason they traded a premium to just the value of those businesses is the idea is that, A, they'll be able to enhance the value of those businesses by either like, uh, by getting a spot on the board and like strategic direction or mergers or blah, 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 blah. Like basically they'll be able to like grow those businesses in value and keep on investing in the right companies that will grow in value. So in some ways they're kind of like a, a fund that you're investing in and just assuming that the people managing the fund are going to keep investing prudently and improving the businesses that are owned by that fund. But it's kind of, it's still me I mean, don't be wrong. 
they've got a proven track record of like delivering significant returns. They do, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it, it, like they're a very good. They're good at what they do. They're a good business, but like it, it's got a little bit of a meme component. The, the premium it trades at over the value of the actual like businesses and stock it holds is relatively high for a business like that because you know it's Warren Buffett. It's Warren Buffett. It's got a bit of energy and about Charlie I mean, Munger. To, to, for those that like have no absolutely no idea what Berkshire Hathaway does, like the way that they have built their business is that the core components of the business they actually own are insurance businesses they own and a ton- banks. Uh, yeah, totally. So they own a they they own a bunch of insurance businesses like Geico and ones like that in the US. And the insurance float that comes with that is what gets reinvested, and they've used to like drag them up, themselves up to incredible heights. Mm. It's been a very effective business model. And then Warren Buffett gets up and does his little folksy emails once a year. Everyone loves to read them. Mm. What a lovely little situation they found themselves in. Yeah, but I mean, the, I'm pretty sure the majority of their holdings right now are uh, in the company that's. Spoiler alert, number one on the list. That literally makes up something like 40 to 50% of the, of the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. <laughs> uh, yes. It uh, doesn't take any uh, prizes to guess who that is. <laughs> Next one up is Meta. Meta. 800, $844 billion market cap. Uh, they have proven very resilient. Meta, yeah. you know, Meta, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Threads, of course. Yep. They took a big hit. Oculus. They took a big hit. Uh, what the beginning of the year, la- end of last yeah. year, end of end of last year. Look, but- things looking shaky. They had a lot of uh, news stories floating around about how they were giving teen girls depression. Yeah, you know, they things were looking. They were doing the metaverse. They were, they were doing the metaverse. Things were looking pretty rough. And then the shining light on the hill, threads. <laughs> Saves them. It turned the company it around. The company around. No, well, it turns out that people love to buy things off Instagram, <laughs> like, and that persisted and actually got better. They've got an amazing ad product, right? Yeah, their ad product is really, really good. And as we've discussed before, when talking about other companies, it's really hard to build out an ad product like that. Yep. No, uh, they are. Uh, they've done quite well. And they shit. They they fucking earn a lot of money. Apple's app tracking transparency stuff was a direct like. We're going to shoot a cannonball at yeah. Facebook. They managed to evade that. They're doing really well. Well, if anything, it just benefited them more. Yeah, well, they're, they're the last one standing. It hurt Snapchat more than hurt them. It hurt yeah. all these companies more than it did them. They're doing very well. Obviously, they're making a huge AI play. They're not talking about the metaverse nearly as much anymore. doesn't necessarily mean that that that's gone, but it certainly seems that if they're going to re-litigate that whole thing, which, you know, thanks to sunk costs, they surely have to. Yeah, yeah. It's going to look different. It's going to look a lot different to what it looks like currently. Yeah. You know, but typing on your little virtual keyboard in your fucked virtual office as like a weird Nintendo me type character yeah. is maybe not what it's going to look no, like. No, I mean, they're already pivoting to like, well, when we said virtual reality, it didn't necessarily mean that you're seeing the virtual reality. Yeah. It's like the virtual reality could be all around you. In some ways, wearing headphones is a virtual reality. <laughs> it's kind of where they're at now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg's like, in a way, isn't reality kind of like being in a big old computer? <laughs> It's a physical social network. Yeah, yeah. He's like, remember when you used to get go to the computer room in your house? You had a big beige tower and a big boxy CRT monitor. Well, that's kind of what we're doing now. <laughs> <laughs> and on that screen is a big nasty ad. <laughs> in, in a lot of ways, marketplace is a virtual reality. <laughs> Very good. Number five is Amazon at one point four trillion dollars. Interesting because it's such a low margin business, but. I mean, it brings a lot of value, I have to say, as a consumer. I hate, yeah, sure, the working conditions sound really bad, being <laughs> monitored every second of your day and, like, having your piss breaks, like, timed. Yeah. I reckon I'd be a pretty quick pisser, but I <laughs> still would rather no one timed it. I just say, look, I understand the complaint, but I'd five seconds flat. 3.5. I could do it in 3.5. Jeff? <laughs> Jeff? I can do it in 3.5. Uh, Pull me in, coach. Yeah. And as, as we said on the Amazon episode... That culture does actually like trickle through the entire like white collar part of it. You know, as I said back then, it was it's so long ago. I think we did it with Mark and Steph, but it was like um, algorithms check like how quickly quick you are to respond to an email and this kind of crap. Fucking horrible. But you know, I have to say I'm a big Amazon user in that I buy a shitload from it. It is really great to get things really quickly for really cheap. Does bring some value. Yeah, yeah. and AWS is obviously a great business yeah. as well. I mean, AWS, if they spun off AD, a, AWS, it'd probably be worth like it might be on this list. <laughs> yeah, like it, potentially, it's it's huge. It's huge. 
they have the benefit that like their core, and this is like a Jeff Bezos thing as well. He said that like it's hard to predict what stuff is going to change and be crazy new, like be AI or whatever. But it's very, it's actually a more interesting thing is to predict stuff is not going to change. And one of the things that's not going to change is that no one's going to wake up one day and say, actually, Jeff, I wish I could get my packages a week later than mm. I currently am getting them. So as long as they can maintain like a delivery network that's getting stuff to you next day. Yeah. They're going to be in a great position because very no, not many else can do that. Timu can maybe kind of do it if as long as that object is like a weird uh, like chain that costs thirty cents. Yeah, it's like a fold a out cup. Map. A bath, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Amazon, what are they doing in that space? I don't know. Uh, next one up the list, and as you start going up this list from here, the the values start to escalate pretty significantly. So they're no longer. That's the thing. Like Facebook, you know, we, people talk about Fang and whatnot. They're not a big company when like when we when we talk like serious big like scale scale bro when we talk seriously big meta who uh, have what four billion users that's not big enough like that's it's not though they're under a trillion dollar market cap yeah and you know what that does that that keeps them out of the uh the 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 big the big dog club nvidia is the next one up i mean this is above 1.1 trillion dollars market cap we have done an episode and i could we could talk about this because I speculated in our, in our episode, like, are ah, NVIDIA worth that much? And, like, it's one of those annoying things where it's like they kind of are because NVIDIA, obviously, the reason they've, they've grown to such tremendous sites and, and uh, full cards on the table, I did own NVIDIA stock and then I sold it after, like, an insane pump and then it proceeded to pump, like, three <laughs> times more. Like, but anyway, um, right now, if you want to do AI, if you want to build big AI models, you basically have to use NVIDIA chips. Like that's there's no two ways about it. But their supply is completely drained for years out because you need to get advanced NVIDIA chips. So that has led to when AI became a thing at the beginning of the year, as well as people like looking for places to put their cash and looking for alpha, looking for returns, everyone just pumped into NVIDIA, which as you said, it's basically like the AI index fund. If, if you want to invest in AI, AI. You can't think about any individual companies. You know that the rising tide of AI will lift NVIDIA because they're, they're the only game in town. Not the only game in town. Obviously, there's like Google's building their own chips, Microsoft's doing its own yeah. thing. There are competitors emerging, but NVIDIA are pretty far ahead of the game. Yeah, they're so far ahead of the game. It will realistically take years for anyone. No one's going to build a better chip, most likely, because this has been NVIDIA's core competency for like, what, 40 years now. Yeah. Like, not focusing on AI. That kind of pivot yeah. was a decade they ago. They came from... Vic- video games, graphics, but even, you know, they sniffed out the AI stuff ahead of everyone else. So yeah. they've, they've had a big head start in building the technology for this. Yeah, so they're a long, long, long listen, way ahead. Listen to our NVIDIA episode for more information. Yeah. And also, that's we, we talk quite a lot about I, I think that they're overpriced, but I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of hard to tell. But I'm just saying, if they bring back those sexy elves on the graphics card box art, yeah. to the moon, baby. Oh, then it's undervalued. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Totally. But that's the Imagine thing. Imagine if the A100 just had like a sexy nymph on it. Just like a nymph with a bow and arrow. And open AI are like, sorry, did, can we just not have <laughs> not have that? And like, and in her foot is like a crossbow. She's got a bow and arrow and a crossbow in her foot. Imagine that. <laughs> that's Jason Huang's like log game. It's like, we need to establish a platform and a position. Then all of a sudden they're going to open their shipment from Taiwan and it's just busty orcs. And if you want to know what we're, we're talking about, what the context is for what the fuck we're talking about, talk about the box art. Listen to the Nvidia episode. <laughs> the old the old graphics card box art used to be provocative because uh, it meant to it was meant to appeal to these kind of like adolescent nerds, basically. Yeah. And look, they only want one thing, which is a lot of pixels. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you fill in the gaps. Next one up the list. We're getting into the top four now, folks. Top four companies. Yeah. Alphabet. Yeah. 1.6. Google, obviously. Google, yes. Uh, and then obviously the, all the other constituent businesses that they have floating around inside that yeah. that big that uh, big thing. Google is, I think, the most interesting company on this entire list by virtue of the one that I think two years ago you would have said they were probably the safest or mm. one of the safest. Yeah. They had built an unbelievable company which was like self-sustaining uh, in the sense that like their ad network was only ever going to get be- bigger and better. Continue to absolutely print money. One of like the great money-making innovations of the 20th and 21st century. Yeah. Yeah, great internal cultural of innovation that, like, you know, yeah. spun out things like Maps and Gmail. Building all and... this sort of stuff. And I'm obviously I'm not saying that all that stuff's going to disappear overnight, but 
they are in the the rough position, which we talked about in our A episode last week. They have a real competition from the AI stuff. Their core product has been thoroughly and shitified. Mm. Google search is just bad oh now. Oh my god! <laughs> what was I searching? Like on the weekend, I was searching for like Tiva sandals, and you get something like in like on the standard page, on the standard ad page. There's like pictures of maybe twelve or fourteen different sandals from like Timu and yep. like, but full square pictures. Then sponsored links. Then, like, you know, some weird crap thing. Then, finally, organic links. Like, it is, it was scroll, 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 a peak in shitification. Absolutely. And it's uh, it's a problem they're very much aware of. Yeah. Um, and they're trying to resolve it by introducing their own AI stuff. And here's the thing about Google. And it's, uh, it's also the fact of a lot of big tech companies, a lot of huge companies, they stop becoming nimble and able to respond to these kind of threats, A, because they've been sucking on the teat. Mm. The rivers of gold have been flowing for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they've been absolutely dominant. But also, like, Google has, like, 1,500 VPs, <laughs> you know, which is which is high even for, like, a comparable company. Yeah. Like, 1,500 VPs. That's loco. How do you move it all? Like, who owns how you, what? How do you move it? Like, that's just, like, a like, recipe. How do, you have a stra- how do you execute a strategy? For, te- for territorial – it's just territorial disputes. Yeah. Like, people look clamoring for – uh, for victories in their own, and making make sure making sure their own patch is looked after, mm. uh, and this also, you know, this has been put forward as one of the reasons why Google can't maintain a product mm. is because the only way in that kind of insane environment that you can actually establish yourself is by just launching shit, not by like maintaining it and making sure it becomes great. Especially when you're always going to be compared to the core products that are absolutely killing it, like search, maps, YouTube, yeah. you know, the stuff that's like astronomically high. Yeah, yeah. But as you said. It brings in a shit ton. If you're a business, you still need to advertise on Google right yep. now, yep. for sure. All right, number three, controversial introduction to the list. We've included it. A lot of lists of the top 10 by market cap don't include it, but I thought we'd put it on there because it's funny. Also, it, it's vaguely related to our um, premium down round logo. Mm. Saudi Aramco. Yeah. Enormous oil company. The reason it doesn't offer it, so that, that has technically $2.1 trillion market cap. Mm which is obviously very high. They also end up a lot on the, they're very high up on the list of top com- largest companies by revenue because they also make a bucket load of money. Obviously, this is an oil company. Mm. The reason it doesn't often get included on these lists is one, it's listed on the Saudi stock exchange, which is one of those things where people are kind of like, mm. <laughs> you know, we'll see. In 20 years, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. And also the fact that the amount of stock that's actually floating is very, very low as a percentage of like, Total stock. Yeah, as in like, most of the stock you can't buy. It's like whatever. 2% or something. Yeah, whatever, so like you, you 98% of the stock is just held by you know Saudi or whatever. So 2% of it is actually available to be purchased. So therefore, the price is determined by assuming that that 98% is worth as much as what people are willing to pay for this small 2% that's like floating around, which, you know, is questionable. It's very questionable. Like, if you put 100% out on the market, would it still be worth $2 trillion? Like, would the demand basically be there for the stock? Yeah, no. Um, Whichever way you look at it, it's an extremely valuable company. There's a reason we all hear about Saudi Arabia, which is like, you know, not a massively interesting or like relevant (laughs) country in basically any other respect. (laughs) Like, let's be perfectly honest. Yeah, totally. But well, uh, the line. Yeah, but that all stems from this. It does. Yeah, this is all. It's all reinvestment of that stuff, the Republic Investment Fund, what have you. Yeah, absolutely. I read a really interesting article. This is just like ancillary to it, but it was talking about like. If you are in Saudi Arabia and you are like a smart young guy, and I say guy explicitly because <laughs> you unfortunately have to be a guy, mm. but if you're just like smart and you've got it out in university, University of Riyadh or yeah. whatever, yeah. and you don't know what you're going to be doing, you go work for Saudi Aramco. Mm. That's just what you do. It's like the equivalent of being in Australia or the US or the UK and just like going and working for Boston Consulting Group or Deloitte or McKinsey or something. It's just like, I'm smart. They'll have a job for me at Saudi Aramco. Yeah. Just absorbs that kind of talent, which I think is kind of funny. Well, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, totally. It's yeah. a huge country dominating company. Like, I mean, it's fucking huge. Yeah. Huge business. They put out a lot of barrels of oil. Mm. Geopolitically relevant. But vibes are off. I'm going to put it out there. There's a reason why the US is does their air logistics while they bomb Yemen. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's not to do with just like really <laughs> hating the Houthis. <laughs> No, for some maybe. <laughs> but in terms of their l- longevity as a business, I don't know. They're obviously they know that 
because you know they work hand in glove with the Saudi state. Mm. They know that oil is not forever. Yeah, that we're, everyone's going to go green, and hence the reason why we get. Hence why we're all moving to the line. Yeah, we're why we're moving to the line. Most innovative city in the, on the and, and why MBS spends so much money like buying video game companies and stuff. Yeah, he's like, well, if we can't have oil, we can have the metaverse and a another moon, a second moon, <laughs> moon two, folks. <laughs> That's the board pitch. But yeah, we're obviously very pro Saudi Arabia. Extremely pro, as we've made They're, clear. Every investment decision they made is wise. I think that Aramco should be worth $3 trillion, so Okay, great. Undervalued. If the full float was on the stock market, it'd be worth $3 trillion. Great. We're in the top two companies, folks, and neither of these are a great surprise to anyone. Number two is at $2.7 trillion market cap, Microsoft. What uh, is there to say? Uh, wow, it's like greeting an old friend for F. You know, and, and to think that Microsoft Teams could be 2.65 of that... Minimum. And then the rest of it is Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> Still stuff on Xbox over here, but I'm I know not a gamer. You, you, you've made, you've, you've made no, that. No, no, I mean, it's from a number standpoint. Microsoft, what a company. The thing that people don't think about when it comes to Microsoft or the, uh, the power of Microsoft, I think, is like, you know, say Slack and their sales team. Yep. Well, I know they're obviously owned by Salesforce now, but compare, say, a Slack, just imagine what Slack's, sales team is compared to Microsoft sales team. Yeah. The power of Microsoft sales team being embedded everywhere in basically every corporation in every city of the world, just having lunches, having consultants, working with the CMOs and the CTOs and the CFOs across the world means that that is a company that is not going to go away fast. No. And yeah, like their enterprise sales function is probably the best out of in world history. Right? Like it'll be, it would certainly be up there. Like they've, they've it's, done. It's inc- them and probably the consult and maybe McKinsey. <laughs> yeah, for, totally. They've obviously done incredibly well, and they also had like a fairly significant turnaround. Like they went through the period of a deep lull during like the Steve Ballmer mm. years. They missed mobile, so like the whole mobile era, they didn't fully sit it out, but they did put out essentially a failed product there. They should have persisted. No, they should have. And I think actually Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, said that. Yeah, he recently. said that recently, didn't he? he, but, I mean, he basically which said, I, I've always agreed with. He said we shouldn't have gotten out of it. And like, it may still prove you can still post some big Ws from having phones. I don't think we've eluded the phone era. So like, they're gonna, they're still gonna feel that pain for a while in the sense oh, of not having a device. Absolutely. Yeah. Like they don't have a portable device. Yeah. They just, and they had one. Yeah, they had one. Uh, they don't even have like a real great position on any portable device. Like, yes, you can get the Office mobile apps. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can get Outlook for iPhone or whatever. And But still, it's a pretty tenuous position. Yeah, but they they just kind of have moved away from consumer other than in like Xbox and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but yeah. like as far as Office is con- Microsoft is now Office. They made the pivot from Bournemouth to Nadella. Nadella did this from Windows to Office. Literally, it was part of their strategy that like, Microsoft is Windows. Windows is intrinsically linked with our business and the success of Windows is the success of Microsoft. You don't really think about Windows anymore. Like you think about Office. That's their core product and it's really good. It's really good at offering lots of things. I fully admit, and I never have, like people, you know, I talk about Teams or whatever and how you should have it. It's not because I think Teams is the best chat platform. It's that it's good enough. And that's like every single Office product. Some of them are the best. I think Outlook is probably still the best email client. But for the most part, and, and, and Word is probably the best word processor. What the? <laughs> yeah. Excel. But point being, a lot of their products are not the best, but the fact that you get them all for a low, 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 a low, low price. Yeah. And, uh, and I will say an underlooked thing we probably should have talked about on, in the AI episode is like, if it is true that they roll out AI Assistant for all of your stuff for Office 365 at 40 bucks a month per seat, they've got more than 100 million users of Office 365 paid. That's a lot of cash. Point being, there's still innovation and revenue to be generated yeah. from Office 365. They're really, yeah. So, I mean, they they have rolled the dice more than any big tech company on AI, I think. I mean, I don't know. You could Google is obviously doing it. Amazon's doing it. Um, obviously, NVIDIA is is on the list too as, as a core thing. But Microsoft are really betting the farm on it mm. and clearly think that their AI partnership with OpenAI and, you know, their own internal stuff is like where the world's going. And then, but they're obviously thinking from a very enterprise perspective. Yeah. They're not really thinking about the consumer side of it nearly as much. They're leaving that to open out of resolve, I guess. Yeah. And they're just trying to fix everything else. I don't think they're we're we're losing Microsoft anytime soon. <laughs> the number one big dog, which is not that far ahead, two point eight nine trillion dollars is shock horror. Apple, the Apple, Apple Corporation, the Apple Corporation. Um, 
What's there to say? What they is sell, there to say they about, sell a lot of phones. What is there to say about Apple that hasn't been said about food? That hasn't been said about oxygen? <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. What is there to say about Apple that hasn't been said about sexual intercourse? That's so true. That's actually incredibly true. I will say, because I, I don't need to sit here and litigate exactly why Apple is a large company. <laughs> they sell a lot of iPhones. And a, you know, at a high margin. At a, at a, sh- at a shockingly high margin. Uh, you know, they sell some laptops too. Yeah. But that's certainly Again, not- Again, at a shockingly high margin. At a, sh- at a high margin. You know, they have they make TV shows. Jury's out. <laughs> Jury's out at a low margin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're making a pivot into being a services company, blah, blah, blah. They're launching a new platform, which is yet to be tested in the market. What I will say is like their biggest like risk profile and everyone's kind of talking about it now because mm. we've be- we've had Tim Cook for a long time, for a, for a long while. Yeah, the he, cooker. He has basically said, and there's been reporting that suggests that the Vision Pro is sort of his hurrah. That's yeah. his crack at doing something amazing. Yeah. And then he can retire a happy man, essentially. Yeah. So obviously they would be talking about who the successor is. And I think if you take the long view, you'll see that Tim Cook has taken what was already an incredibly successful company and just like supercharged it on the money side. Yeah, yeah. He's a brain for like supply chains and pricing and products. Yeah, and- which is why, yeah, as we've discussed before, the touch bar hung around for so long. The shittest Apple Watch that had massive black borders hung around for so long that they were still selling iPhones with a button literally up until like a couple of months ago. Uh, if they're not, I think they've just got rid of that. They might still be available an iPhone with a button. Yeah. An iPad with a button still exists, et cetera, et cetera. That's all Tim Cook brain. Yeah. Like it's a, you like maximize. Apparently it's like literally they have to meet certain margin profiles and you just keep selling them until they do. Because yeah. obviously they're much cheaper to produce as time goes on, like these old devices because they use older chips. The fabs have already paid off all of the equipment that's used to build the chips and blah, 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 blah. Um, and all the equipment has been produced, so that's all been paid off. So you, your margins get higher. The t- the cook doctrine is keep selling it until we hit our whatever it is forty percent. Whatever the crossover is, and then we'll stop. Margin, then we stop. Yeah, yeah. He's not why they they last for ages. He's not a product intuitive product genius like you know Steve Jobs is alleged to be. Mm. Oh, and and you know I think it's fair to say he probably was like he was reasonably visionary in that regard. I don't want to sound like I'm sucking him off. I'm yeah. just saying that he's a product brain. You know, and he he, he dem- demonstrated that in a, a few different domains, even like starting Pixar and things like that. Yeah. Tim Cook would never start Pixar. No, you know, you could see him like running the VFX pipeline at Marvel, like a absolute a <laughs> complete maniac. Like a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like driving VFX artists to into the into the grave. He could do that. I just don't think he would be able to to do that side of it. So it'd be interesting to see like what Apple's board does as sort of like a succession plan. They must be thinking about it yeah, now. Yeah, there are a bunch of people that, you know, people always read the tea leaves of like who gets to talk at, you know, the Apple events and whatnot on yep. who's next. But Because, um, yeah, they, they've it's built... probably for another episode. It's for another episode, but they've built they've built an insane pipeline of, of stuff. They, there's a huge amount of money coming in, although, you know, it is slowing. Phone sales are not going up. No. So they're facing that kind of existential threat, at least in terms of like in, insane unlimited growth. We don't know if the Vision Pro is going to be successful. It looks kind of cool, but yeah. is it going to reach scale? They seem to be having problems getting AI off the ground internally, or what yeah. their AI strategy is. So, like, I uh, think I the- agree. It's like it's a bit shaky at the moment, but at the end of the day, yeah. the amount of iPhones in people's hands means that they just have They've- the most insane advantage. Yeah, like their install base is insane, they which can- means that anyone else's success, be it open AIs or whoever's, helps Go- them. Or Google, is it helps them? At the end of the day, it helps them. Yep. Facebook, whatever, it helps them because. For the most part, it's going to be accessed via an iPhone. Yep. So I don't know when we do this episode again in ten years. I still see Apple up there personally. Apple's up there, number two behind Saudi Aramco. Yeah, obviously. That's my call. If you're listening to this, did you know there's another world out there where you get a second episode of Downround a week? Yep, it's called Downround Premium. That's right. And there's no interruptions. No interruptions, no ads, two episodes a week, including the free one you're getting right now, plus another one. Yep, seven bucks a month, not a week, a month, downround.net. Downround.net, instant access to the whole back catalogue as well. You've got so much to catch up on. There's so much. Get around it. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs>